We're indeed thankful for these good songs that have lifted our hearts. Praise to the Lord. I've been thinking about uh, our situation. Just a minute here. Pardon me. Our situation with this uh, thing. I don't know if we can get a wire connector and set up another one over here so we can see one too. Where they might go. We'll try. Oh, you're over here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, it would help. We have a little screen or something, too. Okay. So I, I kind of cut that first song piecemeal, but whatever I heard, I gave it all I had. <laughs> so I got some of the phrases. It was good. I just listened to the rest of it and enjoyed it. But we appreciate these songs that have lifted our hearts up in praise to the Lord. It's appropriate that we should be appraising people. And I hope that we can learn to be more boisterous with our praises. Just want to review this one verse. We won't dwell on it, but just to mention it in passing in the book of Psalms. Uh, at number 95, we recently examined that passage for those who follow up on things on Wednesday night. And the first verse says in Psalm 95, O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord, and let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. As great as God is, it doesn't seem like, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Fits. It seems like this is what fits. Praise the Lord! Glory to God who has redeemed us from our sins and set us on a pathway to eternal life. Hallelujah! Hello? You know, we talked on that. I tried to address both the tendencies of the extrovert and the introvert. The introvert will have problems with verse 1. The introvert wants to get by saying, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Lord has taken away all of my sins. There were millions of them, and he took them all away. But the extrovert would say, praise the Lord, glory to God. He took away all my sins. There were millions of them, but he took them all away. But then the extrovert may have a little problem down here later in the psalm. Ah, uh, Yes. Verse 6, O come, let us worship, let's bow down, let's kneel. And verse 7, the last sentence, let's listen. So, either way, God's after us. That's right, either way, He's after us. He, he wants us to come to a place where we will give Him praise, and be boisterous. One thing I appreciate about Brother Honoree and the saints up in Evanston, when they say, well, we need to praise the Lord, they are kidding when they say that. He gets on that microphone and he's just a holler for all he's worth. And the nation just praise the Lord minute after minute after minute after minute. And finally, all you can do is join in and just holler with them, you know, praise the Lord. He's worthy. But he's also worthy of us humbling down, bowing down, kneeling before him, and listening. So I just wanted to throw that in there. I hope we can get to where we will be a little more boisterous in our praising in a consistent way. I know at times we are. God can push us out of our lethargy or whatever you want to call it. But it would be a wonderful thing if we could get to where we just are. Full of praise, loud praises to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's sort of there. Okay. It's sort of there. I'd like to look at this verse in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17. We kind of touched on it last week. And we touched on it, the concept of uh, we form judgments on a totally new foundation and totally new basis. 
based on what Christ has done for us, not seeking to know him merely from a human standpoint, but to know him for who he really is, who, who he will be to us as the Holy Spirit reveals him to us through his word, to know Christ not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Tried to draw attention to the fact that the Jews had formulated a concept of Christ after the flesh. And they were expecting a political, military, economic deliverer. And they weren't at all thinking in terms of redemption from sin. They just weren't. Some were, I, I, let me rephrase that, but the, the, this notion predominated. And what God was concerned about was redemption from sin. The need for humanity to be released from the grip of sin. As it says in Colossians 1, he's, the Lord has translated us, he's moved us and repositioned us out from under the authority of darkness, the power of darkness or the authority of darkness, into the kingdom of his dear son, which is of course a kingdom of light. We're now under the authority of light. The light of scripture, the knowledge of scripture starts exercising rule over our lives. And that's one of the things that's unique to the church. The church is where light is to prevail and it exercises authority over us. But he says here, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, he's a new creation. And it takes time for the realization of that, the awareness of it, the experience of it to really set in. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I remember when I was baptized in the spirit, as a 13 year old boy, they told me, well, you're just getting started. I had really no idea. I look back on that now, I had no idea of what I was really involved in and what was in store in walking with the Lord. Now, uh, approaching 60 years later, I can look back over a, a lifetime of experience in Christ and realize that God really did start something new. Praise the Lord. When you receive Christ, something new yeah. gets started Hallelujah. in your life. Amen. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Is that a wonderful thing? Wonderful. Something new gets started. So he says, if any man be in Christ, it says he is a new creature, actually a new creation. There's actually a literal uh, expression there. Yes, the man is a new creature, but he <clears throat> is also, if you're in Christ, it's, it is a new creation. And just like the old creation came into being out of nothing, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word created, the Hebrew word bara means to create something out of nothing and it's used strictly of God in the Old Testament. It's never used about mankind creating something or whatever because uh, what was the old joke about the devil and God? The devil was challenging God that he could be a good creator too and God said, okay, go ahead and Show me what you can do. So the devil picked up some earth and started to fashion a man. And God stopped him and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Create your own dirt. <laughs> Create out of nothing. That's God. And so this new creation is something out of nothing. Remember that Bill Gaither song that said, uh, uh, heartaches, broken pieces, ruined lives, what you died for. Your touch is what I long for, you have given life to me. And the first, the first verse I believe starts off with, uh, I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. 
what's the rest of it there? Uh, slips from my mind right now. Yeah, heartaches, broken pieces, that's in the chorus there. At any rate, we were nothing. We came to God, and all we were was a temporary assemblage of dust. That's all I am in my body. I'm a temporary arrangement of dirt. And when life leaves this body, this temporary arrangement of dirt will go back to being nothing but dirt. That's exactly what God said in the Garden of Eden to Adam. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. But he gives us a period of time for that dust to be organized into an organism. And we have life momentarily. Whether our life is 50, 60, 70, 80 years, or just 20. I now look at people dying in their 50s and their 60s. You see it on the news and so forth, and I think, why? How, how young? How incredibly young. And I think, what would, what would, the, the last 20 years of my life, say somebody died when they were 53, the last 20 years of my life, if I just take that away, how much is in, is in the last 20 years of my life? And it causes me to realize all I am is a temporary arrangement of dust. Nothing. But Jesus Christ received a commission from his Father. He was the anointed one of God to bring a new creation into existence. God is behind it all. If you'll notice in verse 17, or verse 18, it says, all things are of God. That word of means it came out from God as a source. God is the source of it all. Yeah, and Jesus made that plain in the days of his flesh. He always honored his heavenly father. God was the source. But God also made it plain that he had committed all judgment into the hands of Jesus. And that he was his beloved son, his anointed one. And Jesus uttered these words at the conclusion of his life. It is finished. He had created something new. He had created a world of redemption. A world of redemption. And so, maybe we could use the word realm or sphere of redemption. So he says in verse... 17, if any man is in Christ, a new creation, the man is, what he's involved in, it's all a new creation. And it says, old things are passed away, or old things have passed away. What are some of the old things that passed away? Well, I'd like to suggest to you there's two categories. The general category of old things that have passed away and a specific category. The general category of old things that have passed away is the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant with all of its animal sacrifices, its observance of a religious calendar, the actual keeping of the Sabbath and functioning of feast days, those were all symbolic. And if you look over here, hold on to 2 Corinthians 5 and look in Hebrews, the 8th uh, chapter of Hebrews, the writer says, Now of these things which we have spoken, this is the Son. We have a high priest which is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven to minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Look at verse 5. These sacrificial gifts 
that were currently going on when this book was written in the temple. They were going on still in Jerusalem in the temple. He says, these things, verse 5, serve unto the example and what? The shadow. Everybody say shadow. The shadow of heavenly things. The old creation was a shadow. The old covenant, rather, was a shadow in the old creation. When you receive Christ and accept him and walk with him, you're not grabbing a hold of a shadow. To take on the symbols of the law, the calendar of the law, and keep all those things, that's holding on to a shadow. But Christ is the real substance. And it's a new creation. So from that standpoint, old things have passed away. The old law, the old covenant, isn't that God's will isn't to be found there. That's why we study it, because he has revealed his will in the Old Testament teaching. But the covenant is an old thing that's gone. The old way of judging people is gone. But there are specific things that happen in each of our individual lives. Old things pass away. All the old ways we used to live, the ways we used to think, the sins we used to commit, all those old things specifically in each of our lives pass away when we unite with Christ Amen. in faith, in faith. Amen. And then he says, behold, everybody say behold. behold. What does behold mean? It means look. You were going to sleep, I just woke you up. Look with an exclamation point. Boy, have you ever started to turn onto a street and you think you've got it all cleared, you've checked both ways, and one of the passengers in the car with you sees something, not a car coming, but they see something and they'll say, oh, look! Or something of that nature and you're driving and you're thinking where's he where's he coming from what am i not seeing have you ever had that experience well if you have it why keep driving you may not have had that yet then but you drive long enough you'll have that experience okay i don't know maybe silas has pulled one on you one time or another i don't know you ever had that experience even that you just you're, you think you got it all figured out and Owen hollers out, surely you wouldn't do that. <laughs> I remember I was riding with Brother DeVault one time, I think it was, the preacher who was in Des Moines at the time. This is back when I was a kid. And uh, I don't even know the, the occasion why I was riding with him in this car. We were going somewhere. And he was trying to lean out and look down this road, and I was looking down the road. I was just a kid. Finally, he said, well, Steve, is there anything coming? And I said, no, there's nothing coming. Nothing but a big truck. <laughs> well, you know. But look, behold, old things have passed away. The old system, the old individual personal life with all of its struggles and, and corruption and everything else you want to put in it, that's passed away. Look. It says next, read it with me here. All things are become new. Actually, a stronger translation is all things have become new. Perfect tense. English. And it's also perfect tense in the Greek. Some all things have become new. In other words, they are instituted. They are here to abide for eternity, and it will never be otherwise. All 
things are new. Now, the problem we face, and we, we alluded to this last week, is that all the new creatures are in, involved in a battle. Just because it says all things, the old things have passed away and all things have become new, doesn't mean that presto changeo, something is real easy now. No, it isn't. I'd like you to look in Jeremiah, if you would. The prophet Jeremiah is writing, and look at chapter 13. Jeremiah 13. God used Israel for several purposes, of course. One was to give us the Messiah. We wouldn't have it if God hadn't called Abraham and instituted the nation of Israel. Another thing he used Israel for was to be a, a lesson, an object lesson for all of us to look at them and see what we are like, to see what human nature is, to understand how humanity thinks, and to see a reality there that we can study and learn from it and be different by the grace of God and the indwelling presence of Christ. Well, here it says, Deuteronomy 13, uh, Jer uh, pardon me, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 13 and, and verse 23, it asks a question. It says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Now, how hard would it be for the Ethiopian or the black man to change his skin? How hard would it be for the white man to change his skin? How hard would it be for the bald man to grow hair? Back in my younger days, I did have some. I had a barber tell me when I was in my mid-teens, well, the reason you're losing your hair is you need to massage your scalp. Go buy you some suave hair cream, work it into your head every day, and massage your scalp. I was faithful to do it, and still, every time I combed my hair, I had hair on my comb. And I never really, I really didn't see this coming. It blindsided me. I should have known, uh-oh, this hair is coming out. And I should have looked around at all the bald-headed men in the church and realized, I'm headed your way, brother. I'm, I'm, I'm coming towards you. Just didn't dawn on me. All I got out of that routine was real nice, wavy, cur curly hair. Finally, when I was in my later teens, 1920, I was working in the hospital in Orlando, and I got to talk to one of the residents there, cardiology resident, and I was telling him about, you know, my hair and everything. He said, you can't do anything about it. He said, wait just a minute. He, he runs down the hall, makes a right turn into the uh, quarters of the residence. I, don't, I really don't, don't know what they had in there, but it was where all the residents were, because it was for the doctors. It was right around the corner from our department. He comes back out with this great big thick book. He thumps it up. See right here. It's predisposed. Baldness is predisposed in your genetic. You can't do anything about it. So when I read this verse, the Ethiopian can't change his skin. The leopard can't get rid of his spots. It's part of his DNA. And the bald-headed man can't grow hair. Now he draws an analogy. Then, if, if that can happen, he says, then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. So when it says all things have become new, it doesn't mean that living for Christ is a piece of cake. It doesn't mean walking with Christ is an easy thing to do. 
It doesn't mean experiencing the reality of this new creation in Christ is somehow or another something that, hey, it's easy. It's like taking candy from a baby. That may not be so easy. That baby may scream pretty loud. We are accustomed. When we come to Christ, we are accustomed to doing evil. We're comfortable with evil. We're comfortable, you know, with all the various vices you can look at that humanity gets involved in. They're comfortable in those things. The drug addict is comfortable being a drunk, drug addict. The self-centered person is comfortable being self-centered. And on down the line, you name it. Whatever specific thing would apply to each of us in our specific life, we are accustomed to doing evil. We're comfortable with it. So this verse shows us that it isn't just a piece of cake to say, well, I'm in Christ now, everything, I'm a, I'm, I'm a new creature, I'm part of a new creation. It, there, there's no fight. No, it's the biggest fight you will ever have in your life. You might think, well, the biggest fight is learning how to put up with that ugly boss on my job. That ain't nothing compared to getting rid of your old self. That's the biggest fight, is getting rid of ourself. So, what can we do? What can we do? I'd like to show you something here. Just like the leopard has his spots, we have habits. When we come to Christ, we have habits. Somebody said, do something once or do it never, there's a big difference. Do something once or do it twice, there's not as much difference. What are we saying? If you, if you don't do that thing the first time, you will never have the habit to contend with. If you do something the first time, but then you do it the same thing the second time, all of a sudden now, the pathway towards a habit has been opened up. We come to Christ, we have habits. How do you know it's hard to overcome a habit? I have limited myself as much as I know how that I don't like to, you know, they, they say these soft drinks are bad for you. So I pretty well limited myself to Pepsis and things like that when I'm eating pizzas or Mexican food. They just doesn't seem like pizza and Mexican food would go that good with tea or water or heaven forbid milk. Coke just seems to fit. But it's a habit and I am, oh, I love those Cokes. Especially if you've been out on a hot day and you're sweating to pour an ice cold Coca-Cola or Pepsi and just feel that running down your throat. Oh, it's a habit. And every now and then there's a little bit of struggle limiting myself to just pizza or Mexican food. I find I would like to have it on a Sunday afternoon, whether I'm having pizza. But I do limit it, because it's not good for you. So I've, I've sworn off of drinking so much of that stuff. That's just an example of how easy habits are. Now, habits can be good, and habits can be bad. That's true. I'm talking about the ones that interfere with our new creation in Christ. Another thing about the old life is we like evil. Evil sometimes is just downright fun. Hello? Thank you, Brother Ken. It's just fun to do evil. You say, well, I, I don't do anything evil. I don't think it's fun. Well, if you like your self-centeredness, it's just fun to be self-centered. Hello? Sure. Evil. It's just, we love it. We like it. And we've already mentioned this, but the verse has said you are accustomed to doing evil. 
we can function so long in a, an atmosphere that we don't detect, that we don't even know it's wrong. We don't even know it's wrong. We can have an atmosphere in our thinking, an atmosphere in our emotions, a way of thinking, and it's the way we've always been, and we don't even know it's wrong. We're real sleepy to finally wake up one day and, oh, Lord, you mean you're displeased with how I'm thinking? These are problems, our habits, our customs, what we're used to, what we like to do. And here's a big one. I'm talking, I'm talking about making the break between the old creation and the new. It's not just a piece of cake. If you want a battle in life, if you want a challenge, start reading the Bible and taking it seriously for what it says. And start right where you're at. And sometimes, especially when we're young, we have these romanticized views of, of grandeur, how we're going to really make a difference in the world, we're going to be this. And we, we, what's the will of God for me? And we're thinking in terms of these great big things we're going to do in life. Start with yourself at home. Start with yourself and the people around you. Start taking the Bible seriously and learn how to love mom and dad, brothers and sisters. Learn how to love the people around you. Learn how to get along with people on the job. Learn how to make your boss look successful. All these things. Start there. Because if God puts us on a big assignment, but we're not really prepared with the nuts and bolts of the genuine real character we need, we won't be ready for the assignment when it comes. What if God would have taken Joseph at the age of 17 when he had that dream of all those chiefs bowing and the stars bowing to him? What if he would have said, okay, Joseph, who here is 17? Do we have any 17-year-olds? Who? Nathaniel. Stand up, Nathaniel. And over here, Rachel, Benjamin. Stand up. You're 17, right? Any other 17? All right, that's how old Joseph also got this dream. And so poor old Joe didn't know enough to keep his mouth shut. He told his brothers, he told his father, and, uh, and, and he, they all got upset. You mean to tell me? This is going to happen. We're going to bow to you. What if God would have said, all right, Ben, we're going to make you prime minister of Egypt. Can you imagine Benjamin being president of the United States right now? <laughs> Rachel, be president. You'll be president. Right now, you'll be president. Forget about Trump. Forget about Biden. Rachel, she's our girl. Nathaniel, president of the United States, prime minister of Egypt. God didn't do that. You could sit down. God had to process Joseph. He had to process him with slavery, betrayal, false imprisonment, neglect, being forgotten. And finally, 13 years later, when he was 30 years old, he had been through so much and had kept the right attitude towards God. And God said, now, now you're ready for the big thing. Young person, you want to do the big thing? You start with the little things right where you are, where you live today. Amen. You start there. The big things will come in due time. They'll come. The big answers, they'll come in due time. But, but if you don't start working on the ABC building blocks of your own heart and your own character, you'll never be ready for the big stuff when it shows up. Thank goodness. No offense, Joseph. No uh, uh, Ben. No offense. No offense, Rachel. No offense, Nathaniel. You, you just happened to be 17, and you just were a knob I wanted to turn. But here's the thing that really gets us. Not just our habits that, and our customs and, you know, all that that we've talked about. But it's our failed attempts at success. We could call it an enfeebled will. You can try and try 
and fail and fail and try and try and fail and fail to walk in some aspect of the new life that Jesus has mapped out for us. And our failure weakens our will and we suddenly now we're not contending with just what we're comfortable with, with the fact that we like evil, with our habits. We're suddenly dealing with the fact that there's no use in trying. I can't do it. I have failed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That's the big one. Our will gets washed away by our failure. I don't care if you have failed a thousand times or ten thousand times. You are still on the ground of a new creation in Christ. And it should cause us to just hit our knees continually and say, God, it's me. I know what your word says. I, I don't know what the answer is. I know there's something wrong in me. I know I keep failing. I know I keep missing it. But Lord, I believe you're bigger than all of this. I believe you're bigger. We have to do that. So it isn't easy. Because we're dealing with spots that don't want to change. We're dealing with hair that doesn't want to grow. We're dealing with all these habits and customs and comfortableness and the, our tendency to like evil and our failed attempts at rising above it. But it says, going back here now to 2 Corinthians, just about done, I think, here. 2 Corinthians 5. Let's read it together, the 17th verse. I hope you can see something in this verse that will help you in your personal life and your personal walk. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Let's read it together. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away already. It's a, it's a world of the past, corporately and personally. Uh, macro and micro, so to speak. Behold, look at this. Let's read the verse together now. All things have become new. And I still see my spots. Lord, I'm coming to you. I believe in you. Look at verse 15. When we come into Christ, here's one of the new things that becomes new. He died for all that they which live should not henceforth. Everybody say henceforth. After this. This is a new thing then. This is something new. Henceforth. What's the new thing? Henceforth they do not live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. In other words, the first step to getting the victory is to... Place Christ front and center before you and keep him there. Every day. It isn't something you just decide to do uh, once. You do have to make that once for all decision of committing yourself to Christ. Then every day becomes a challenge to represent your members to righteousness. As it says in Romans 6. Represent yourself to Jesus. Every day that you arise, Lord, this is another day you have given me. I want to represent myself to you. I want you to be at the center of my life. You to be at the center of my affections. You're the reason that I live. You say, well, I, I live so I can do my job. Yes, but that's part of him. He gave you that job. We're praying that he will give Brother Kim, this job at the air, at the uh, Fort Knox, we're praying and asking God for that. Be a, a blessing to him. I don't think he would mind me sharing this, but let me just share this from Anthony's experience. I don't know, some, what was it, 12, 15 years ago, that business and all? Yeah. He came in one Sunday afternoon after I talked along the line of, well, you know, we need the Lord in all things. And he says, why do I need the Lord for my job? Is I just The job is just there. I, I get up and I go and I do the job. 
Well, then he got involved in seeking to build a cleaning, uh, sailing cleaning business. And it fell through. And he got involved trying to do a construction business with uh, Joshua Whitlock. And it was successful for a while, but it fell through. And finally, he was down to the bare bones. About that time, we produced this first CD uh, with singing his song, Stephen and myself, and singing his song, the very first one. And uh, I would take these CDs to a meeting, I would sell them. We'd, he'd paid Neil Morris down in Nashville to rent his studio. Neil did the sound engineering and all that. Uh, he'd put out some money to get those things made. I'd go to a meeting and sell them, and they seemed to be selling, and people liked them, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd come back with a few hundred dollars cash. He'd put that in a sock in the drawer, and he lived off of that with the groceries that kept him from starving to death. And things started falling behind on his house. And, just... and during this time, my wife and I got to talk to him. I think it was before he heard from uh, Cognos. We got to talk, he says, you remember when he said, why do I need God just to do my job? I wonder if he's looking at that a little differently. Well, at the, at the low point, and he had tried everything. He even paid uh, several thousand dollars for this group up in Chicago to promote, you know, the, the, it was, a, I think it was more of a scam than anything, but, you know, to try to promote you and get you a job and so forth. <laughs> but unbeknownst to him, they were planning a computer overhaul out here in Cognos, which is now BASF, but back then it was Cognos. And on the other side of the world, in the nation of Germany, one of the vice presidents of Cognos was talking with Anthony's former boss, Mike Gilbert, who's still out here. They were sitting there in a meeting, and they were going over what they were going to have to do to restructure all these computers. and said, boy, this is going to be quite a job. This is going to be a lot of work. He says, what's Anthony doing right now? He knew, he, he knew he'd quit. And so out of the clear blue, he got a call. From Mike Gilbert out here, wanting to know if he'd come and work on this project. God did it. Amen. It wasn't too long after that he testified. I believe it was in this church. You remember that testimony that he gave, saying, "I was. I used to think I didn't need God for this or God for this. I found out I need God for everything." Everything. Yes, amen. It did my heart good to hear that. No, I just tease it. Just tease it. Just tease it. But we live for Him, not ourselves. Look at verse 14. The love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ just captures me like in a straight jacket. I can't get out. When you keep Jesus before you every day of your life, and when you go to Jesus, not only on a daily basis, but on a moment-by-moment -moment basis with little arrow prayers. Don't try to live on arrow prayers. You need to have a genuine prayer time and devotion with the Lord. But sometimes you're caught in life situations, you just got to shoot an arrow of prayer up there. How many of you know what I'm talking about? When you can do that, and the Lord moves in your life, and finally... You begin to see a history of God's love being manifested towards you. It has a constraining effect on you. And as you fall in love with Jesus, you start falling out of love with the things that we used to love. Hello? Also look at verse 14. Not only the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge. 
And here's an important theological fact. It's hard for us to get our mind around this. I remember when I first started trying decades ago to get my mind around this truth. It doesn't come overnight. And when I say it, you'll probably sit there and argue with me in your mind. Go ahead and argue, but I know I'm right. I know I'm looking at it right. It says we thus judge if one died for all, then all died. We dealt with that last week. All died. It's hard for us to see ourselves having died with Christ on the cross when we're very much alive physically and we actually didn't physically die. Now, you've got to think about this a minute. If we physically die because we believe in Jesus, that doesn't, that, where does that put you? In All Saints Cemetery over here. To die with Jesus has to mean something other than just physically dying. It involves a decree of God's judgment. It involves how God sees us. When you step out of that old creation and believe that Jesus died for you and you believe also you died with him on the cross, you're now living in God's new reality. That's the way God sees you. As a new creature, born again by his spirit. And he is so much in love with you as a new creature that he wants to do everything he possibly can to help you and lift you and encourage you and strengthen you. And he's not deterred because you missed it a thousand times. He stands ready to help you as you strive for time number 1001 to get the victory in a certain area in your life. He's with you. He broke that chain. There's a new power. There's a new world. And our sleepy headedness spiritually causes us not to see that for what it really is. Because you still drive the same car. You still work on the same job. You still kind of like the same food. Oh, Matthew, what do you like to eat? Don't say anything. Be specific. Tacos. Soft shell tacos. Do you know if you liked soft-shelled tacos before you came to Christ and gave Him your heart, you can still like soft-shelled tacos. Tacos are neutral. There's not a sign down there that says Taco Bell, and it has, in parentheses after it, evil place. No. What do you like, Jonathan? What do you like? Give me a dessert, yeah. Cherry pie? Oh, triple berry pie. Isn't it wonderful that when you believe in the Lord and you seek to walk in the victory of the new creation, you don't have to stop eating triple berry pie. Oh, Brother Eddie, you don't have to give up that ice cream. Well, I don't know. Maybe they don't want you eating it now. I don't know, but... It's not because of Christ. Maybe just for now, the health, I don't know. But, see, there's some things that are in neutral ground, but there's some things, there are the old. It's, God says, that's done away with. I'm ready now to bring you forward in a new creation. It'll be a battle, as we said, but you can win it because there's a power available through union with Christ and your failures to succeed point to your need for him. I remember one of the young men, teenager, asked me, a young man, I was just in my 20s at the time, a teenager in Tampa. He says, well, how are we going to ever get this victory? I said, you're going to get it by being defeated. And he just looked at me like, huh? Huh? I was only in my 20s when I said that. Probably 26 or so, 27. 
So you go, when you fall on your face, and 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 you just keep falling on your face. One of these times it's gonna wake up, you wake up when you're down there on your face, and you're gonna say, God, I know your word is true. And I know this thing is not bigger than you. It is bigger than me, but it is not bigger than you. And I'm crying out to you for help. And you may fail after that. You may not fail after that. But God does give the victory. He does. He gives the victory. Some victories are hard in coming because we've had habits that have been ingrained. And we also have now a will that is so weak. We just, I don't want to try anymore. It's just, oh, the battle is just too big. That's why we need Christ. That's why we have to keep him front and center. And what, this is where you're going, this is where you'll start losing the victory is when you let the devil work in such a way that suddenly Christ isn't front and center before you. Something else is. Christ isn't there. Pleasing Him. Worshiping Him. Trusting in Him. Seeing Him for all that He is. Not after the flesh, but perceiving who He is as a life-giving Spirit now at the right hand of the Father, giving us the power of the Holy Ghost. So you're part of a new world, a new order. Let me give you this verse in Revelation chapter 21. We were not privileged to be in the moments of Genesis 1. Wouldn't that have been neat? In fact, I've often desired, I don't think it's going to happen, but I've often wished, when we get to the other side, everything's finally settled down, wouldn't it be neat if God had this big screen? Oh, I don't know, 100 miles square. And you could, it was out in outer space. And all the earth dwellers could watch as God gave us a view of how it all began. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be? I uh, probably not going to happen, but it would be neat. But you are able to see the new creation he's forming now. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have permanently become new in Christ. And whatever's being established in Christ is here forever and ever and ever. Not in this form. We will go through death or a moment, twinkling of an eye, translation at his return. But we will move to the other side. And when you get to the last couple of chapters of Revelation, God's describing the bliss, the joy, the excitement of the other side. We're not on that side yet. We're on this side. And on this side, we are in the fight of our lives to participate in this new order. And it's like we are getting to see this be created right in front of our eyes. We couldn't see Genesis 1, but we are seeing this. Notice what he says in Revelation 21, verse he that sat upon the throne spake. Here's what he said. Behold, look. Just like it said, behold, all things have become new in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, behold, look. I make all things new. He didn't say future, I will make all things new. He didn't say past, I have made all things new. He did say that in 2 Corinthians 5. 
I have made a new creation, a half, perfect tense. Here's present and with a progressive thought. I am making, I am currently making all things new. When we step into Christ by faith, we step into a realm of a new creation that will finally end in the bliss and the joy that you read about in these final chapters of Revelation. And God interrupts that and he says, Behold, I am currently in the process of making all things new. When a sinner repents and begins to walk with Christ, God is making all things new in that person's life. When a people collectively are being formed and transformed in the image of Christ, God is making all things new. There was a time when my dad was a man of the world. But at the age of 27, God interrupted his life. And he stepped into a created order where God was making all things new. He was privileged to participate in that order of creation for several decades until he finally died, almost 89 years old. But then God dropped the curtain on his life. His opportunity to participate in the new created order of Christ was forever sealed. He is now awaiting the resurrection. And in the resurrection, it will become evident what God has been doing all these hundreds and hundreds of years since the day of Pentecost. He is in the process of making all things new. This is your chance. This is my chance before our bodies go back to a disorganized mass of dust and dirt. This is our chance to step into that new creation every day of our life. Keep Christ at the center of your life and let him transform you. Let him encourage you. Let him lift you up above all those failed attempts that discourage you and seem to drag you down. He's more than able to do it. Blessed be his wonderful name. Praise the Lord.